Welcome to Morning Coffee and Maestros. In today's episode, we'll be exploring influential black composers who changed the course of classical music. The music of many of these composers have, has often been underprogrammed and undervalued, and we hope today to spark your interest, maybe even your curiosity, to learn more about these trailblazers and their compelling music. We'll be discussing in detail many of our favorite works and composers, as well as talking about the richness and the significance of the African American spiritual. And of course, we would like for you to join in the conversation on both Facebook and YouTube. Use the live chat function to ask your questions, make comments, and just feel a part of the discussion. Feel free to ask us questions and maybe share some of your favorite compositions by some of your favorite composers or tell us what your favorite spirituals are. But today we'll be focusing on the black composer. So we'd love to hear about your love and some of your favorite pieces. Uh, of black composers. Absolutely, and we would love to hear from you. But before we get started, I have two comments. One is, I didn't get the memo about the cool African shirt. I, you know what? I was trying to figure out how to look as good as you. <laughs> and this just so happened to be hanging in my closet. I was like, you know what? I feel like we're talking about, you know, black music today, so I'll wear my daishiki. Oh, <laughs> see, I wish I had one of those now. Oh, it's my mom to get you one. <laughs> Excellent. Oh, this is good. Thank you, Bessie. Uh, last episode, we were discussing pandemonium or possibilities and planning a season in a COVID-19 world. And this week, we are thrilled to start one of those possibilities. Tuesday, we recorded our first two episodes of the Come Together Choir online choral rehearsals, volume two. And we'll premiere these episodes beginning Thursday, September 24th at 2 p.m. Eastern, last, uh, uh, 2 p.m. Eastern each Thursday. Last spring, we had more than 400 uh, people who registered to be part of the Come Together Choir. The episodes have been seen by uh, 5,000 times already. Wow. It's crazy. That's awesome. Well, Kikarel has a real passion for education and community outreach. The Come Together Choir was created for our off-key chorale for those living with Parkinson's and their care partners and our Where Are My Keys chorale for those living with memory loss and their care partners to continue singing even during this health crisis. They get so much out of our weekly rehearsals so this is a way for them and, and really a way for all of us to keep singing during this time. And we're going to be learning 11 songs from the folk music era of the 50s and 60s. These are songs made popular by Pete Seeger, Peter, Paul, and Mary, Bob Dylan, the Mamas and the Papas. And you can register to get the music sent to you, either the music or the lyrics and uh, PDFs of those. And so you can be able to sing with us each week. So stay tuned for news about this sep September. But I have to say we had nine of our singers, plus Jamal and I, and we were singing and rehearsing for the first time since March. So what was that like, Jamal? Oh, it was euphoric just to, <laughs> just to be able to, to make music um, and to, to sing again. How was it for you as a conductor? I mean, what, were, what was, was it euphoric for you, but was it also kind of weird with people singing in masks? Uh, it was both euphoric, uh, euphoric <laughs> and weird. I think the, the thing that was really interesting for us is um, we spent all summer trying to figure out what are the different kind of protocols we're going to uh, put in place. And so this was the first week that we put all those, uh, we kind of did those. We had a wellness representative who meets the singers at the door, checks their temperature, mm -hmm. um, make sure they don't have any COVID symptoms, all those kinds of things. We, we fog the room before everybody comes. We set the room so everybody's socially distanced and everyone's wearing a mask. And so getting used to that new environment was really strange. Yeah. Um, but our, you know, our real concern is just making sure that we're doing everything we can to uh, mitigate the risks that we're, we're taking. But the most important thing is the singing. I mean, that was euphoric. And even, even singers singing with a mask is better than not singing at all. Mm -hmm. And hearing our singers come together and make that great sound, it's just like, ah, that's what I've been missing these past few months. Well, at least, at least Trish has, has added something new to her resume by being the <laughs> official fogger. <laughs> yes, we have our, our, marketing, our marketing goddess, Trish Ivey, is now also our disinfectant specialist. So everybody, every, you know, it's a non-for-profit organization, so everybody has everybody to cross train. Chip in. Well, I have to tell you, for this episode, we've created a listening list with biographies of all of these composers and links to uh, performances of these great compositions. So if you look in the notes below this video, you'll see a PDF that you can download, and I really encourage you to do so. Once you do, you can continue to learn and discover more about these amazing people and their music. So 
Last week, we, we focused, we talked about um, the pandemic, and the week before that, we had our favorite pandemic list. That's our right. Our top 10. So today, we are focusing on black composers. Um, I think mo- mo- majority, except for one, uh, is, is of American descent. Um, so, Joe, what's, who's our first composer today? Oh, our today? first one. We're going for Joseph Bologna, ah. who lived, ah, he lived the uh, second half of the 18th century, a contemporary of Mozart. He was the first significant black classical composer, and not only was he a composer, but he was also a very gifted violinist, a virtuoso violinist, and conductor of one of the leading symphony orchestras in, in Europe, really. And it gets tricky uh, if you're a neophyte like me going, why does he have so many names? <laughs> so he has his given name, which is uh, Joseph Bologna. Then he has his honorary title, which is Chevalier de Saint-Georges. Ooh, mm. that sounds very exciting. So he was uh, uh, given an honorary title of the Knight of St. George. And so his claim to fame besides music is he was a champion fencer. Wow. So you don't get that every day. No, you don't. In fact, there's even a painting in Buckingham Palace of him in a, in a, a fencing fight that's <laughs> still there. And uh, he was considered the greatest swordsman of Europe. And Louis XV named him the Chevalier de Saint-Georges after his father's noble title. But even though France had the Code Noir, um, even though he was given the title, he really couldn't accept it because of his African ancestry. Mm. So Bologna, he grew up, uh, was born in uh, f- the French colony of Guadalupe. And he, uh, he was the illegitimate son of a wealthy French plantation owner and an enslaved African Guadalupean mother. Uh, and uh, he was about 10 when he and his mother followed his father uh, and the rest of the legitimate family back to France where he was enrolled in elite schools and got private lessons in music and swordsmanship. So he has, uh, he has a couple, and, the, and his third nickname is the, the semi-racist nickname of Le, Mo, Le, Le Mozart Noir, the Black Mozart, which is sort of, well, whenever. Um, but when you hear his music, <laughs> it does sound a lot like a young Mozart, or yeah. even a little bit like Haydn, one of your favorite composers. <laughs> um, and in 2003, they, they uh, had a movie about uh, Chevalier Saint-Georges, and uh, it's not very accurate, but it's very sensational and fun and dramatic. But if nothing else, it's a, it gives you a chance to kind of learn more about this trailblazer of, of, of music. And his big break happened in uh, 1772. Um, he became a violinist for a, an organization called the Concert d'Amateur. Mm. And it was, uh, at that time, um, the best orchestra in Paris. Some people even thought in Europe. And he, uh, it didn't take long for him to become a concertmaster. Eventually, he even became the uh, conductor of it. And in 772, he kind of wowed uh, the Paris world by um, playing two of his violin concerti and um, under his direction. And it just, it was one of those things where people just heard a new voice they'd never heard uh, before. And he wrote a lot of music, um, violin concertos. He wrote uh, more than a dozen, two symphonies, three sets of string quartets, and um, there are a couple of little connections with Haydn, your favorite composer. <laughs> um, he uh, actually commissioned Haydn to write six symphonies for um, his orchestra, and those became uh-huh. known as the Paris symphonies. I never, I knew that there were the Paris symphonies, yeah. but I didn't know the connection. And um, the other thing that was interesting is in 1778, Mozart traveled to Paris where he stayed for a number of months, even under the same roof as uh, Bologna, which is kind of interesting. Oh. So it's kind of implausible to think that he had not heard some of Bologna's music and Mozart vice versa. Wow. Um, so it's kind of interesting from that standpoint. What I thought was really interesting was um, Bologna wrote a lot of symphony concertates, um, which are, for people that don't know, it's a, it's a concerto with orchestra, but instead of one soloist, it's two or more soloists. And those were kind of in the rage in France at the time. So he wrote, I think, eight of them. And um, Mozart had never written one of those, but when he returned from Paris back to Austria, guess what he wrote? A symphony concertate. And some of the uh, musicologists have said there are certain musical gestures that are um, a part of that piece and pieces to follow that we never heard in Mozart. So Mm. it begs the question, is Bologna the black Mozart or is Mozart the white Bologna? Hmm. I know. That's a good one. I I think that... uh I think that they probably each, I mean, they, they I, listening to his, his string quartets and, and having been able to play one of them in a quartet, um, you definitely hear the parallels of, of Mozart, um, but he has a voice of his own. Certainly, which is, yeah. which is, which is fantastic. 
Uh, so I would say that he is the black Mozart and, and Mozart is the white Joseph. Well, See, I yeah. think so too. That, <laughs> that works. Well, I chose, uh, uh, I looked around and tried to find something I really, that really spoke to me. Um, he wrote two symphonies. The first one is great, but the second one for me is just, there's something just inc- inherently joyful about it. Mm-hmm. Um, the minute you hear it, you go, oh, what do we have here? And it's so interesting. And I found a nice recording of, that's on this link. So if you, uh, at home, you, if you haven't already, um, download that PDF and you'll be able to see more about these composers, but also be able to hear their music. And uh, Tafel Music Baroque Orchestra is a really fine orchestra. Um, so they have a really nice recording of this symphony. It's, um, I think it might be 20 minutes. It's really brief, but it's excellent. And then I thought because uh, he was a, a virtuosic violinist, I thought why not show them um, some of his violin concerti. So I picked one of his uh, violin concertos from the same album. It's really um, amazing. And to think um, you know, just the thought of thinking about history in 1770s, and here is uh, a man of, of African descent that is leading one of the largest, you know, one of the most uh, famous orchestras in Europe and writing this great music, but yet most of us today don't know his name. You know, I think that is, is one of the frustrations of, of traditional music education is in order to to hear about these composers or to know these composers, you sort of have to do research on your own. Um, it's not instinctly taught as part of the music history. Um, those who are violinists, um, such as you know, such as myself, I got to know his music in my private lessons. I got to know his music in my chamber music ensembles that I was playing in, but he didn't really get to know his music in the context of traditional music um, history. And I, I think it's, it's got to change, and I, I think that this discussion itself will be, be a good one for all musicians to, to listen to. Yeah, I think you're right. I know what really struck me as we kind of prepare for this one is thinking back to which now feels like a million decades ago when I was in um, taking music history as I you know, was sitting in my, in my first four years of college. And um, I'm pretty certain, if I remember right back, the, I think the Grove Dictionary Music, or not the, the Grove, uh, whatever our book was, mm-hmm. I forget what it was called. But anyway, what I remember about this was William Grant Still, Scott Joplin, yeah. and I remember, I remember uh, the teacher I had, um, you know, we got all the way through and he said, oh, and Gershwin wrote an opera called Porgy and Bess, and you go, okay, he's white, but okay. Um, <laughs> Good for him. <laughs> but, but, it, but I have to say, you know, it was, it was, you know, certainly looking at jazz and blues and those kinds of things, there was a little bit more discussion, but I think the cla- talking about classical music, I think that discussion might have been five minutes. It was yeah. very brief, and uh, I know in uh, the two major books that are used um, in colleges today about music history, only one of them mentions uh, the... Uh, Chevalier Saison. So yeah, we we my we did not we didn't even approach that approach him in in my music history, um, both in undergrad and in grad school. So the other person that uh, I never heard about until well after college was Florence Price. Yeah, Florence Price is is sort of a jack of all trades, uh, master of all. Ooh, I like that master um, of all. And, and when it comes to classical music, uh, Florence Price was a organist, a pianist, a composer. Uh, and she happened to study at the New England Conservatory, um, which later on people, um, many African-American composers, but specifically both her and William Grant Steele had the opportunity to study at New England Conservatory. Um, the interesting, interesting thing was, was Florence Price was very light-skinned. She's a very light-skinned African-American. So when she went off to New England, her mom told her to, to present herself as Mexican because um, <laughs> hopefully that would be better for her than to oh present gosh. herself as an African-American. And, and talking to a Hispanic friend of mine at New England, he, he said that even till, you know, even up to today, um, there are students of color at New England Conservatory that still kind of deal with that old, wow. um, 
old regard of, of treating of how they treat uh, students of color. What, so what time when when uh, she was going to university? What time are we talking here? So this is this is the this is the early twenties. Early twenties. All right. Um, so yeah. So Florence graduated with a double major. Nice. Not just one, but two performing degrees, one in organ and one in piano. And when she graduated from, from New England, she went back to Arkansas. And it's very interesting because you, 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 you hit on the kind of Mozart and, and Joseph being in the same place around the same time. Both her and William Grant still were both in Arkansas ah. towards the same, same time. Um, but she, she, like any African American composer of that time, she dealt with a lot of racism and segregation. Uh, so after she got married, she moved to Chicago, which was no better in terms of racism, but still afforded more opportunities for, for, for a classical musician. Um, and I mean, I would say within the first two or three years of her moving to Chicago, um, her music was started to be published by companies like G. Shermer, um, which is a, one of the major music sure, publications, yeah. uh, especially out of Chicago. And in her career, in her life, she created partnerships and friendships with, with Marian Anderson. And one of the spirituals that she arranged for, for voice and piano was My Soul's Been Anchored in the Lord. And this actually became the arrangement that Marian Anderson would almost open or close mm -hmm. all of her performances uh, with. But she also had a great relationship with Margaret Bonds and, and many others. Florence has written close to 30 pieces for the organ. Wow. She's got four major symphonies, one of which is Lost. Um, she's arranged 15 spirituals. She's got close to 40 pieces for piano. She has a piano sonata that's really amazing. And there's a group now that's really raising money to, to, to record all of her piano works that they can find. Um, recently, they found her old house in Chicago that had a lot of manuscripts that had never been seen oh, wow. before, uh, which, is, which is awesome. I think in terms of her organ work, um, her, her most famous piece is her uh, Suite Number no. 1. And I have to say that Suite Number no. 1 and Adoration are her two most performed organ works. And Adoration was the first piece I'd ever perform heard performed by Craig Williams. Um, but I have yet to hear a live performance of her Suite Number no. 1. And if there's one organist that I'd love to hear play it, it's uh, Sam Nelson. Oh, yeah. I think Sam is <clears throat> the best organist in town. I, you know, I just, his, his creativity, the way he interprets music, the way he plays, just moves me every time I listen to a recording of his. So I'd love to, love to hear, hear you play this, Sam. And all the other organists in town we love. We do love we them. We do love them all. Let me, <laughs> we, we love them all. Trust me, I, I, I love them all. But there's, 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 I think there's just something special about Sam's performing. I think you're right. Yep. I, just, I really, really just love. Um, the, the piece that Florence is most known for is her symphony number no. one. In, in 1932, she submitted this piece along with um, her piano sonata to the Wanamaker um, competition, which was a very prestigious competition. And she walked away with first place <laughs> for her symphony, and she walked away with second place for her piano sonata, and Margaret Bonds walked away with third place. Um, it was a wrong year to compete. It was, it was a very <coughs> wrong. But this historic win for her led to her symphony in 1933 being performed by the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. And she would be the first black woman to have her music performed by a major American symphony orchestra. This, this orchestra, this, this, the first movement of her symphony is, is, is focused on two melodies sort of reminiscent of, of the African American spiritual. And that's something that's important when you look at a lot of these African-American composers of that time. A lot of their stuff draws on the Negro spiritual. 
Um, the second movement of this piece really boasts influences by Dvorak's New World Symphony. It's, it's based on a hymn-like melody and texture and, and again speaks to her love and knowledge of church music. The third movement, which is the Juba Dance, is based on the characteristic of, of African-American antebellum dance rhythms. So it, it's really got this African but American fusion, mm -hmm. of, uh, fusion of dance. Um, for Price, that's one thing that you'll notice in her, in, in a lot of her works, but specifically in this sy symphony, is the importance of rhythmic element. Um, was just especially in African American music was of most importance and most influence to her and her music. And for me, the best part of all orchestral music is if 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 it's good, it better have some darn good brass Dude, writing. I, I thought you were going to mention brass writing. It's it's, it's got to it's it's <laughs> got to it's and and it's it's nothing that you know. The, this piece is not as complex as like the beginning of Grant Steele's Afro American Symphony, which. Which is, a, which is hard to conduct, just that very opening. This piece isn't super complex, but it, it really boasts um, her ability to write in the classical style very well. Um, and just the textures of the orchestra are just very pleasing to the ear. It's just a really wonderful symphony um, to listen to. So I would, I would suggest finding some of her piano sonatas um, I've, I've got a link up for her organ suite and for her American sim her first symphony number no. one in E minor. So I would really tell the listener to really to listen to those pieces um, just to see the cre even in even in her organ suite, um, just the very opening of the first movement, you, you hear these sort of gospel inspired uh, harmonic, progressions. It's, it's, it's really good. It's really good. I love it. Well, you know, I think uh, she's one of those voices that I think uh, needs to be heard a lot more, and um, that symphony is really lovely. One of the people, when we were thinking about who's on our list, one of the uh, easiest yeses was William Grant Still. Yes, William Grant Still. I think William Grant Still is probably the most famous African American yeah. composer, um, and it awarded him the the term the the title Dean of the African American Composer. Everybody gets a title. It, they do. I'm, I I I <laughs> hope I get a title at some point in my life. Um, Still was born in in Mississippi, um, but like Price, spent most of his childhood in Little Rock, Arkansas. Uh, he attended Wilberforce University, and when he was at Wilberforce, he really learned how to conduct and he learned how to orchestrate. Um, he eventually got to go study at Oberlin Conservatory, and you know you're good when a school starts a scholarship fund just for you to <laughs> attend. <laughs> you, know, you know you're good at what you do. Um, but like Florence <coughs> Price, he would have the opportunity to study at uh, New England Conservatory. And his, his, his start into professional music, which I think really speaks to even uh, his first symphony, was commercial music. Um, so he was playing and orchestrating music for shows on CBS. Uh, he arranged music for two NBC radio shows um, and also arranged music for the films Pennies from Heaven, starring Ben oh, Crosby nice. know that. and The Last Horizon. And he was actually, he was the composer hired uh, to write the music for Stormy Weather. Oh. And he declined during the process of writing because of the degradation of black people from 20th Century Studios. So he was originally supposed to write the music oh, for wow. that movie. Not only was <coughs> Grant still the first black composer, black composer period, to have music performed by a major American orchestra. He was the first African American to conduct a major orchestra. He would lead the LA Phil at the Hollywood Bowl. He was the first conductor of African American descent to conduct an orchestra in Jim Crow South. Wow. He conducted the New Orleans Symphony Philharmonic. Um, and he was the first to conduct a major network radio orchestra 
Um, he was the first to have an opera produ produced by an American um, opera company. Right. His, his, his opera, Trouble Island, was put on by New York City Opera, which is an opera company that has still been going to this day. Um, and actually, I, he, his opera was premiered on network television. That's right, yeah. Um, so till this day, <coughs> Grant's works are part of the major symphonic and chamber repertoire. Um, his most famous chamber piece is his miniatures. Uh, and I love his miniatures. And they're originally for, I believe they're originally for um, wind quintet, but mm -hmm. have also been written for piano, flute, and uh, oboe. His symphony number no. one, the Afro-American symphony, uh, brings together a, a lifetime of musical experience for him. Uh, you see the influence of the Negro spirituals for him. Um, and so the symphony has four movements. And originally, uh, they did not take on the traditional moderato assai, oh, adagiato. Yeah. They didn't take on the original. Originally, the four movements were called longing, sorrow, humor, and aspiration. Uh, however, in the end, just so people would take it seriously, <laughs> exactly. he, he, he published a work with the traditional European movement titles. Um, but I, I implore you to listen to the symphony with the original titles in hand because he really speaks to the common feelings of African-American people in the country. And one of the things that I think he does so well is he does what um, Copeland did with, with the Appalachian, um, just really bringing that Southwest kind mm -hmm. of sound. I think that Grant Steele did it far beyond and before. Um, you really hear the sounds of the Old West and, and, and the Southwest um, in that symphony. And so I think it's, it's an extremely, extremely important symphony for everybody to listen to. Um, but he has listened to his miniatures, um, listened, he has a piece called In Memoriam um, for, the, for the colored soldiers of democracy who gave their life. That's an extremely, extremely moving piece. Um, that's, that is one of the things that I love about African-American composers so much is that they really focused on evoking emotions of what was happening to black people in the country during those times. So even for a, a black person who didn't like classical music, they could see themselves and they could understand their own experience in those through pieces, listening yeah. to, to his pieces. Yeah, and I think what's great is you got the, the In Memoriam, there's a link there to listen to that piece. And I have mm -hmm. to say, um, I have a love affair with the Afro-American Symphony. I just like, every time I hear, it's a fairly short symphony, it might be 40 minutes, something like that. As soon as it's finished, I hit replay. Mm -hmm. it's, and there's something about it to me that I, that always struck, it's just, it's like, it's like, I feel like I'm being, I mean, uh, it's kind of sensual to start. It just, and I feel like I'm just, I'm being, I'm being coerced and brought into this mm -hmm. story. And it just, it, it just feels so completely American. It really yeah. has all of these different, um, just embodies a style, but it never feels like, it never feels like um, it's classical and jazz or yeah. it feels like its own, its own thing. But I, I just, if you've never heard this symphony, you have to hear it, and I guarantee you when it's done, you go, you know, I'm gonna go one more time. Because it's just that, it's that beautiful, that strong and that. It's, it's one of the, you know, he, he uses the banjo in this mm -hmm. piece. You, you really get the elements of, of sort of Gershwin, sort of Copeland. It, yep, it's exactly. kind of a, a, an ablation of all of these, of these sorts of, of sounds but it's, it's him. It's the African-American experience. Um, and I, I think the frustrating thing is just understanding how these artists were getting their music out but still so oppressed by just the, the institution of classical music in America. Um, 
you know, the fact that you could perform their music, but meanwhile in their concert halls, black people are still sitting up in the balcony or not even allowed to come into the concert halls and experience this music. And it just, it really makes you understand and think as to why um, the music really has never reached into the history books. Um, I think that's true. And I, for me, I, I think um, great American music is like we are. We're a synthesis of all these different backgrounds and cultures. And I think the best of American music highlights that. You know, I think Copeland had a way of capturing sort of a voice of America, mm -hmm. but I don't know that it really brought a lot of styles together. Maybe I'm wrong on that, but I do know that to me, the best of American music, when I listen to it, I hear ragtime, I hear jazz, I hear blues, I hear um, Western styles. You're saying all of those styles coming together. And to me, that's what, um, you know, it, it, it highlights who we are as a country. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, it's never just one style at the expense of another, but yeah. I think that's where I really like it. And, and you know, you think about um, like jazz and, and uh, those things, certainly the next composer we put on the list, people probably know Duke Ellington um, from a jazz perspective, but may not know just the incredible craftsmanship he had yeah. as a composer. Duke Ellington was, was a genius. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, take the A train, and if you if you ain't got that swing, are all of our favorite I know. Duke Ellington pieces. Gotta love um, my satin doll. But people don't know so much or focus so much on the fact that he really was instrumental in blending the classical symphony and the big the uh -huh. big band, the big jazz band. There's one piece called the River Suite. Um, and this piece boasts great traditional orchestral writing with sweeping jazz influences. And it's, it's not like a, it's not like um, one of his other pieces, um, the, the, uh, he did his own Nutcracker Suite. The suites. Nutcracker Suite, yeah. And the Nutcracker Suite is kind of like jazz band with classical orchestral accompaniment right. to it. The River Suite is very much a, a blend of a blend the best of, of jazz and, and, and really great orchestral writing, and, and it really comes together very, very well. And I think pieces like that, I have to believe, are what influenced um, people like Wynn Marsalis, mm -hmm. um, not just in the area of big band, but Wynn Marsalis has, has, I think now, has two symphonies that he premiered with the New York Philharmonic one called the Swing Symphony. Um, and it, it really takes on the same parts of Duke Ellington's music of, of, of blending what's the best of, of classical orchestra with the best of jazz music. Um, just some interesting things about Duke Ellington is uh, Linda Johnson presented Duke Ellington with the President's Gold Medal in 66. Nixon presented Duke Ellington with the Medal of Freedom in 69. He has 13 Grammys, <laughs> 13 <laughs> Grammys. Um, he has a Pulitzer Prize. He has a United States commemorative stamp with his image on it issued right. in 86. Duke Ellington is not just important to jazz music, but American music. All, all of these composers deserve equal treatment in music education. Uh, Duke Ellington really is a genius, um, and he, in my opinion, gave voice to the class, the elegance, the creativity of Harlem, New York. He's got this piece called um, Harlem, and then there's another piece called Tone Parallel to Harlem, which is more orchestral. but. Duke Ellington, to me, is what gave sophistication and class to, to the black experience in music, um, especially in jazz music and, and in the clubs. I mean, he, he really lifted Harlem to a new experience of, of musical expression. So I, 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 love, I love Duke Ellington more than I ever have, just, just understanding a lot of his um, 
musical abilities um, and, and just bridging that gap between classical writing and, um, and, and jazz. So I, I, I want to ask you a question. We have so many of these great black orchestral composers. How does an organization like Key Corral, without losing its choral identity in its concerts, but how, how do you find ways to, to perform and implement this music as part of the Key Corral organization? Well, I think uh, for Key Corral, we've, um, since I've been around, we're primarily a choral organization, but that doesn't mean that we won't do instrumental music alongside. I know um, we did a Mozart program and we did the Mozart clarinet concerto, even though we're a, key, you know, we're a, a choral organization. So we have a little bit of uh, leeway to program, you know, especially if it's something that's sort of thematic or something that works, where we can program some orchestral music alongside the choral music. And I always think that's nice for a contrast for the audience. I think with a lot of the music we're talking about here, I think the challenge is um, weighing box office with um, yeah. what we, you know, what uh, our mission as artists are. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, as I've been thinking a lot this last couple of weeks, is as I see these pieces, I go, okay, I, I, I love this piece. What do I put that with that I can um, make sure I can fill the house, mm -hmm. but also that people will be able to hear not just something they know, but something that they're going to love. Yep. And I think that what's, what I like about all the pieces we're discussing now is they all have appeal um, to a wide audience. The audience just doesn't know it yet. Yeah. So I think that's where, I, where the key is for us is to really find those pieces that fit. And I know one of them we're going to talk about later I think has a home already. Um, but I think it's a matter of um, the more we learn about these pieces and these composers, it's saying, you know, what, what would be a wonderful complement to it? What would uh, sit aside it side by side and would be either a great contrast or a great complement? So I think it's from a programming standpoint, um, you know, I don't think, um, I mean, certainly you could do a whole program of, of music by black composers, but I think um, maybe what the, the right approach is to do a combination because I think then we're giving people a wider range of musical experiences. And that's what I think is, you know, we've got so much great music, but, um, you know, as I said at the top, it's underplayed and underappreciated. Yep. And so as arts leaders, it's really our responsibility to find a way to get those pieces in front of our audiences, but yet still making sure that we're packaging it in a way that if you don't know the African-American symphony, you're still coming. Yep. So that's kind of where I'm thinking. So we, a lot of the composers we've talked about um, primarily uh, their greatest and most popular works are their symphonies. Um, what composer or composers are out there um, that have made equal and great statements in both the choral world and the orchestral world? That's hard. I mean, I think the, I think the, the composer we picked next, I think, is close to that. Um, William Dawson, um, if, you, if you've been in choirs, ever in your lifetime. <laughs> if you just got in choir last year or you've been singing for 50 years, you have sung music by William Dawson. They're the, the, the absolute kind of masterpieces of the spiritual that everybody has done those. Every high school choir has done one. Um, they're just great pieces and it, he really is known for that genre and for his contribution to it. But yet he was an incredibly gifted composer well beyond just that. And um, his, he wrote one symphony, and it's probably one of the greatest um, omissions in the world that there's only one of them. Yeah. And uh, it was, in a, you know, we were talking about this the other day, and it's called the Negro Folk Symphony. And it, uh, it premiered um, November 20th, 1934, uh, and brought a Carnegie Hall audience to its feet. It featured the Philadelphia Orchestra. It was conducted by uh, Stokowski. Uh, and he was, uh, it was written by uh, then a 35-year-old uh, African-American composer William Dawson mm -hmm. and Stokowski he conducted the, uh, four back-to-back -back performances one of them was aired on CBS uh, one New York critic called it the most distinctive and promising American symphonic proclamation which has so far been achieved mm -hmm. and uh, it was you know it just had a really thunderous uh, kind of arrival but then over the next 18 months it just sort of fell off the radar um, Dawson never wrote another symphony 
And after decades of neglect, I think there's only a handful of uh, recordings, but just um, last June, the uh, Vienna Radio Symphony Orchestra um, has a new recording of it. Um, I like it, I don't love it as much as a Stokowski one, but, sure. but it's very good. It's also com uh, uh, paired with another composer, which I did not know, Ulysses K, um, mm -hmm. who uh, has music that's sort of in the Hindemith genre, but very colorful, but uh, that's a new recording. Uh, and I have to say, I, d I didn't know much about this piece. You mentioned it uh, maybe a month ago we were talking, <coughs> excuse me, and after spending some time and learning it, I truly believe it's a neglected American treasure, and it's probably, not probably, it is truly an American masterpiece. And uh, what I loved about Dawson is he said, when he wrote this piece, he said, I tried not to imitate uh, Beethoven or Bombs, Franck or Ravel, but to be, just be myself, a Negro. Mm -hmm. To me, the finest compliment you could, that could be paid to my symphony when it has its premiere is that it is unmistakably not the work of a white man. I want the audience to say, only a Negro could have written that. Mm. Wow. And, uh, you know, and I think uh, when you hear it, you would say that because I think you have to have a connection with the suffering, um, everything that um, black people have gone through, it's in that symphony. And you know, it's not just despair and anguish, but it's hope and joy. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a three minute, uh, three minute, a three movement symphony. And he uses um, three traditional spirituals and a lot of his own music. And it's emotionally charged, it's, yeah. it's, it's visceral. And I, f I feel like it's, it's, it's organic. It feels like it's being created right there at that moment. Um, and what I was struck with was, because I know his choral music so well, I was struck with his orchestrations. I mean, these aren't, I mean, for a first symphony, the orchestrations are stunning. Yeah. Um, there are uh, moments where um, every, every instrument in the orchestra has some defining little solo moment. Even the bass clarinet at yeah. the end of one of the movements gets it. But it's, it's really, um, to consider it's a first symphony, it's staggering, and it was so uh, well received and then disappeared. And that's what I think is really a surprise. It's, and, it, and of course, as always, it's just got some really great brass writing. It has great brass writing. <laughs> I think we have a question from the audience. Yeah, we're getting a lot of comments from people saying that this is really a great topic and they're, they're enjoying it. One viewer mentioned that she doesn't remember this topic ever being discussed in her music history class <laughs> and, or, or in her textbooks. Um, and I also have someone else who um, brought up two composers that I think you're planning on talking about, but she'd like to hear more about Harry Burley and mm -hmm. Moses Hogan. Oh, yeah. Oh, they're coming. Oh, they really. are coming. They are. You know, Le Leopold Stokowski, I believe, was the American Symphony Orchestra right. in New York. And um, now led by my former college president, Leon Botstein. Um, but of all you know, not really A-list symphonies, but uh, an important American symphony. Um, the American Symphony Orchestra has really done a good job of regularly paying homage um, to contemporaries of our favorite composers, but also of, 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 of black American composers. They have regularly performed um, Symphony Number no. 1 by Florence Price, since Tchaikovsky, that's been one of their pieces that they've performed. Uh, Grant Steele's Afro-American Symphony, um, and also, you know, the Negro Folk Symphony. This is, this people, I, I really want you to consider just the amazing work that was being done within a six-year period. 1931, you've got William Grant Steele's uh, symphony with Afro-American Symphony being premiered by Rochester. Right. 1933, you've got Florence Price, uh, Symphony Number no. 1 being performed by Chicago Symphony. And then 1934, four. you've got Dawson's. So just even within, literally within four years, four or five years, the world was getting to know these composers. But the frustrating fact is the world was not creating a place for them to be among them. And that person you, you, you spoke of is right. No one has had, no one I think in traditional music education has had this conversation um, in a classroom. 
And That's true. if they did, it was one class. It wasn't, I mean, when you think about mu music history, there is always a music theory component to it because you are, you are tearing apart, you're doing harmonic analysis of, of, of instruct and, and identifying their structure in these music history classes. So to can really consider what would music history look like if, if, if talking about theory, talking about structure, talking about harmonic structure, talking about rhythmic structure of these African American composers, what would it look like to, to have people coming out of college with a full grasp of, of American music? And I think to some degree, maybe we would stop um, insisting that every American con orchestra is conducted by <coughs> a European um, conductor. And, I, and I, I don't mean that to be racist. I really don't. I mean it to be frustrated and the fact that um, we really need to be taking pride in ourselves as Americans and in our American music history uh, and culture and, and, and having that be a main influencer of, of the podium and of the American classical ensemble. I think it's true. I know when, in college I really felt like, and not just black music, but <clears throat> we got to like 1920 and they said, well, that's good. Yeah. We, got it, we got it covered. You'll learn about the other stuff later. Yeah. And I think you know, there's a lot of stuff that happened in the 20th century that we just didn't cover. And certainly um, uh, black classical composers was not on the list. Mm -hmm. um, we had a lot of, I know one of the things we've been kind of talking about is a lot of these composers. So we wanted to, um, I think if you haven't heard uh, the, the Negro Folk Symphony, it is an absolute must. Mm -hmm. um, it's a great piece. Um, that second movement is arresting, but uh, we want to kind of go to some other pieces. Um, and one of the pieces I want to talk about that you and I briefly did a while ago, and that is a piece called The Ballad of the Brown King mm. it's by Margaret Bonds, who we talked about before. The text is by Langston Hughes. Um, Margaret was a, a little bit like Florence, was a, a wonderful pianist as well as a composer. She attended Northwestern in Chicago, and she was the first black soloist mm. to perform with the Chicago Symphony. And she wrote music for um, popular singers like Cab Calloway, the Glenn Miller Orchestra, Louis Armstrong, Woody Herman. But yet she also did radio and television specials, um, like some of the others we've talked about, with wo like William Grant Still. But she also wrote some great concert music. And um, her solo uh, art songs and all that, just wonderful, just a wide uh, breadth of music. In 1972, her credo was performed by the L.A. Phil and Zuma Mehta. So she even had a, you know, an L.A. Phil uh, thing. And I think what, was, uh, what I found fascinating about Margaret was um, her connection with Langston Hughes. And they did a lot of projects together. She set songs like uh, a text of his, like The Negro Speaks of Rivers, mm -hmm. Love's Run and Riot, Winter Moon that we talked mm -hmm. about. Um, just a lot of things, small projects, big projects. And um, he was really a part of the family to, to the extent that Bond's daughter referred to Langston Hughes as Uncle Langston. Nice. So, uh, <laughs> but this piece, The Ballad of the Brown King, is a Christmas cantata, and it's set to the words of Langston Hughes, as we said, but also um, it's written in honor of the African, African King Balthazar. Mm -hmm. um, and this piece looks at the Christian nativity story from the perspective of uh, Balthazar, the Brown King. And it's a nine movement piece. Uh, it's for choir and soloists and it has a wide range of styles. It's jazz, it's blues, it's pop, it's um, gospel, it's everything. And it, I heard it for the first time and I was just like drawn in. I went, what is this piece? And it's, it's captivating and I just, I'm, I'm two measures in and you got me. Yeah. And it's just, just the orchestra writing that starts and then the, the soloist comes in and kind of sets the scene and then the choir comes in and you go, oh my God, is that beautiful? And it's so unique, and I thought to myself, you know, there is nothing like this in the repertoire. Yeah. There, it defies classification by every way. Um, there are these nine movements, and um, there are just so many. I mean, the, the second movement is kind of jazzy with almost a pop style. Um, the third movement feels like a spiritual. Um, the fourth movement, which is Mary Had a Baby, was the most popular at the time with solo and choir. Uh, it almost has a little calypso feel to it. Um, the fifth movement I, I thought was really interesting. It starts out with four-part men, and then for some reason it becomes a men's glee chart. Mm. Uh, 
The sixth movement is really in a European classical style. And the seventh movement is this bluesy thing with the women that is just interesting and captivating and the harmony is amazing and the, it's just, it's just amazing. Um, the eighth movement has these jazzy acapella movements and then the ninth movement is an alleluia and a gospel style mm -hmm. and I swear to gosh, it's like you're going through it and you go, I got this gospel style going, you go, and there's organ and orchestra with this and all of a sudden you go, do I feel like I'm hearing Vidor Toccata here? <laughs> and, then, and then the Vidor Toccata with a little bit of a jig and, <laughs> and then it goes back to the gospel style and I think that's what struck me about this piece was there's nothing like it. Uh, and, and, you know, if you don't like one style, guess what? Well, wait 20 seconds. There's something cool around the mm -hmm. corner. And that was one of those pieces I said to myself, you know, it's very Christian-centric, but it's a great piece of music. It would be great for Kikarau. So if mm -hmm. I can find the right piece to pair with that, yeah. you know, we're going to do that because it's, it's, it's just not being done. There's a lot of her pieces that uh, she uh, was one of those that if, if you asked her to write a piece of music, she'd write it and send you the original. Mm -hmm. And her music was kind of literally become all over the country and they're trying to find it. Um, you know, there's a piece that you mentioned, uh, can I come up with a name? Oh, the Montgomery Variations, yeah. which was uh, dedicated to Martin Luther King, yeah. never been performed. Really? Nope, never I been performed. And so it's, but her music I think is just amazing. That piece itself, um, just like amazing. Yeah, there's a there's the piece, the Three Kings, that goes from Belshazzar in one movement to King Solomon in the next movement, and then kind of ends with a tribute to the death of Martin Luther King in the, in the last movement. There's some really there's some really amazing pieces out there that, you know, it's one of those things that until you research one thing and then all these other things start opening That's up. That's exactly right. Know, and that, that is, I mean, I, I have always loved the black tradition of classical music, but um, just over the last month of, of, of researching this a lot more, have my horizons even opened up more as to the influence of, of African American uh, men and women in the classical scene uh, in America. It's not just performers, it is people who are composing music that are now cataloged in, in, in the symphony and chamber repertoire um, all across the world. That's true. I, I think uh, what I thought was interesting is just all the things I start to connect the dots now, like, you know, Margaret Bonds and, and Florence Price were together. And um, one of the things I thought was interesting is probably a lot of our viewers know, remember Leonton Price uh, singing He's Got the Whole World in His Hands mm -hmm. on that famous spiritual album. I went, oh, that's Margaret Bonds' Margaret arrangement. Bonds. I never yeah. even... You know, yeah. so there's all those connections, and I think, you know, her music is 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 just a revelation to me. Um, another uh, piece that we wanted to chat with uh, chat with everybody about was the Hiawathan Wedding Feast by Samuel Coleridge Taylor, mm -hmm. and that is uh, was written at the the turn of the twentieth uh, century, and um, just an amazing piece. He was a British composer who's popular around the, the the turn of the twentieth century. His greatest success was this piece called the Hawaiian Wedding Feast which was widely performed by choral groups all over England. And during that time, um, it was as popular in, in England as Messiah and Mendelssohn's wow. Elijah, which I had no idea, wow. never even heard of this piece. Um, and the text is from Longfellow's Song of Hiawatha. So this one describes a, a, a Native American wedding feast, maybe in too much detail, but a lot of detail. And I think what probably reached, probably what I think captured his, uh, Coleridge Taylor's fascination was there's so much you can do pictorially with, with the music that's there. And at that time, um, you know, we were learning a lot about Native American uh, cultures, and so a lot of it's there. And um, it was so successful at the premiere. Uh, in fact, they actually uh, printed the music before they did the premiere. Wow. So, and so many people had bought the music that yeah. it was already a success before they even played a note of it. And so much so that he, they asked him to do a sequel and another sequel. So. Um, he also did uh, The Death of Minnehaha and Hiawatha's Departure. They're again, these um, choral orchestral, almost oratorio-like pieces. Um, and he wrote an overture uh, called The Song of Hiawatha, which is sometimes played just alone. It's incredible. The orchestration is amazing. Um, he liked Hiawatha so much, he named his son Hiawatha. 
So he had a deep, <laughs> a deep commitment to Hiawatha, probably because it gave him cash. Probably. <laughs> but um, uh, it's an amazing score, and I think um, what's amazing to me, I listen to it, it's very energetic, it's very joyful, but he was 22 years old. Wow. 22 years old, and he has this wow. gigantic hit. Um, they loved it in, a, in the United States as well. Um, it's great choral writing. The orchestra never um, overbalances the chorus, but they support each other. But really, I think the, the chorus does the, the heavy lifting. Um, you know, the text is very unusual. There's nothing like it. And I think harmonically, what I loved about what he does is it moves so swiftly from key to key. When you're looking at the score, it's like every 14 measures we're in a new key. Yeah. And I think what happens is he's able to use his harmony, his harmony and, and the key relationships to keep this story moving forward. And so it's like, a, I think it's like 30 minutes or so. Um, so I encourage you to listen to it. It's a great piece. It's on that link uh, sheet so you can get that. And also uh, his symphony in A minor, another stunning piece. Um, talk about the, the titles again. He was the American Mahler, yeah. um, you know, so. Uh, but so we've, we've, we've sort of, as we've looked at the, um, the black American composer and, and their symphonies, the common thread is the Negro spiritual. It is. It is sort of the common thread. So I, I think we want to move into just talking about, talking to some degree about the Negro spiritual and, and, and who has made it sort of famous. Um, we, <clears throat> the tradition of, of spirituals come from a come from a long time ago. We look at the slave movement um, and just slaves use this to communicate with each other, but slaves also use it as a way of uplifting themselves and, and reminding me and reminding themselves that there is something greater. Um, and for them, it was <coughs> heaven. It was their, their I identity of, of Christianity, um, that there was something greater beyond uh, this toil. And in, in, in the foundations of, of black church music was singing these spirituals, but it was all about using their hands and using their feet. So there, there was no, you know, giant pipe organ. There was no Hammond B3 or, <laughs> you know, pianos. The black church originally in America was, was, was really tracing its roots from its, from its African roots of, of using the body as its, as its instruments, as, as something very percussive. Percussive, right. Um, but then you have important composers like H.T. Uh, Burley. And H.T. Burley really brought the classical form, the classical art form to the Negro spiritual. Um, and he made it in a way that, you know, now at this point, black churches all across America have pipe organs in them. They have choirs and robes. They've, they've kind of conformed to this traditional American right. uh, church sort of <coughs> role. And Burley's writing all of these spirituals um, for, um, for the black church. And... and, and um, one of his most famous arrangements is Deep River. Right. Uh, one of my, f that is my all-time favorite spiritual is, is Deep River. It's great for a baritone, too. It right? is. Ah, you oh, got all those nice low notes. It and is nice. I think, um, you know, Dvorak, uh, when he was in America, he asked the question, where is your folk music? Where is America's folk music? And he said, this country must be founded on what are called Negro melodies. And, uh, you know, Dvorak came uh, and said, you have this incredible rich heritage, it's right here, you're just not recognizing it. And I think, um, you know, thanks to people like Harry Burley, um, that really took that oral tradition of the spiritual and started to notate it and mm -hmm. teach others to do it. And, um, you know, it's interesting that uh, Dvorak said that uh, Harry Burley, was, who was his assistant, mm -hmm. um, would often um, just be singing some spirituals and Dvorak was always listening and going, oh, I need that one. Mm -hmm. And so it was really because of that relationship um, that, you know, a lot of the, the African-American spirituals found their way into Dvorak's music. And it was because, um, you know, Burley with his beautiful baritone voice mm -hmm. was, was singing these tunes. And I think there's so many, um, you know, he did so much to, to kind of move the uh, spiritual into a more accessible form for, yeah. you know, a, another generations to follow. 
Well, you, you look at you look at people. Um, to me, Dawson is really the first uh, a ranger of spirituals that start adding the complexities of good choral singing. Exactly. Um, yeah. You you notice <coughs> more rhythmic definition, more harmonic definition. Um, when you look at Margaret Bond spirituals as well, there's there's a little bit more of that classical Western Western harmonic language to it. Um, but I think really what has set our country ablaze, the choral world ablaze, is just the utter complexities and rhythmic varieties of spiritual settings by Moses Hogan. I mean, a lot of people, a lot of choral conductors don't like Moses Hogan because they feel that his music is sort of hokey. Um, and I actually had one professor who said that to me, and I just said, shame on you. I was like, <laughs> Moses, Hogan's, Moses Hogan's arrangements are really what um, gave such great texture to um, and complexities and really made the art of singing spiritual something that could cross all lines. I mean, you look at Dawson's music, you look at Burley's music, really, it, it's, it's, it's sort of awkward sometimes it to listen a little, to yeah. a white choir sing them. Um, and I mean, you know, with, with Moses Hogan having his own chorale, I mean, you know, a hundred black people with these huge voices, I mean, that's something you can't buy. It was, it was amazing. Um, but still, I feel like Moses Hogan really made the spiritual accessible to all cultures. Um, and truly made it an art because uh, it's it's for every one accessible choral arrangement of Hogan's, there's like ten <laughs> that you can't touch. Difficult <laughs> exactly. ones that that take. For, I mean, my soul's been anchored is one of those very really, difficult. very difficult uh, uh, arrangements to sing. But he has some really beautiful, you know. Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart. He's taken, you know, traditional hymnody. My, um, Abide with me is also one of his, one of his, be just a beautiful arrangement. Um, but I think Hogan, hands down, is the greatest uh, arranger of, of the Negro spiritual. I think you're right. What I th think is interesting, it's sort of, uh, you look at like Dawson and Burleigh and Hal Johnson and that era, that really sort of did sort of like f the first major phase of that. Mm -hmm. And then Hogan takes that, Moses Hogan takes that and just blows it into amazing proportion. I think what's, to me, what's great, what's, what's sad about Moses Hogan is um, he died at 45 from a brain yeah. tumor. Um, uh, I remember at, um, I went to an American Choral Directors Association convention and heard a whole concert of Moses Hogan with his chorale doing these pieces and it was kind of new on the scene then. It was like, uh, you know, if you weren't a Christian, you would be one by the end of that. I mean, it was just, the, the music was so great. The arrangements were so fresh, so rhythmically uh, uh, vibrant and exciting mm -hmm. and complex, but yet complexity in a way that doesn't take away from the origins of the piece, but build on it. Yeah. And I know there's so many like, uh, Joshua fit the Battle of Jericho, yeah. my favorite one. I'm still scared to death to program it because I don't know if I can teach it. It's difficult. Uh, it's really hard, but when you hear it done right, it's like so amazing. And I think, um, you know, he's, he only wrote 88 pieces, but all 88 of them I want to do. And he had huge hands. He's I didn't know that. He had huge hands. Ah. And that's why he could, that's why he would write so much harmony and so many parts in his music because he had huge hands as a pianist and could write all of this complexity. But the thing that I, I really love about Hogan's writing is kind of what we talked about with, you know, Dawson and, and Grant Steele's Afro-American and Negro folk symphonies is they really, they really gave image to the black experience. And as much as I love Dawson and, and uh, Margaret Bonds and H.T. Burley's spirituals, they're, they're pretty, they're beautiful. But to me, Moses Hogan gave blood and guts to 
to the Negro spiritual. Like he transformed us in giving this image of, I mean, with Joshua flipped the battle of Jericho, I mean, it's, <laughs> you feel like you are, you, you either identify as you are back in Bible times at this wall, or you feel like you are this black person in America trying to tear down the walls of injustice in America. Yep. There, there's such strong imagery from his, from just, just the way he uses harmony and, and rhythm um, and dynamic. His, his, his dynamic contrast is, is, is un, unreal. But it, it's, it's, he, is, he has transformed the, the spiritual and then you have people like Jester Hairston, who lived to be 5,000 years old. <laughs> he was. I mean, he 99, was born in 99. A nine, young 99, a spry 99. Yeah, year old. he was born in ni- 1901 and died in 2000. That's 2000, yeah. Uh, and Jester Hairston, really, I think, of all people of his time, bridged the gap between whites and blacks in, in music. I mean, he has so. I've, I watched a performance of him in Europe. Um, teaching this all-white audience gospel music. And he really is where we, the black church, has gotten the influence of, of gospel music. Um, and it, it's transformed uh, just into this, the experience of, of, of all the people, not just the performers. When you, when you listen to Hogan's music, it's 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 a great thing for the audience to listen to and and you know they're always kind of hunched over exactly yeah. drawn in there but the thing i like about hairston is a lot of his focus was on not just the singers but on on the congregation on the people exactly. involved and he wanted to find a way for the congregation to respond and to participate into what was happening. And uh, Jester Harrison did, did about it all. I mean, he was on TV. He, he had was. a show called Amen that he wrote the music for. Hey, 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 amen. Yeah. So, I mean, that's where we get to the Amen song, and which has 600 verses it that, does have, about 600. that have come from all over the place. <laughs> but um, Jester Harrison really is, is the person I idealize the most just because even within my job of, of wanting to, to bring the audience, not just as people enjoying the music, but participating in the music. And that really is what the Negro spiritual is all about, is participating and singing and telling a story. Um, and, and, and Jester Harrison really, um, really, I think, made black gospel music more accessible to to white audiences and white performers you're absolutely right i know william dawson i put um on uh, the link page which i hope you'll uh, take a look at i found um this week some wonderful recordings of him conducting the tuskegee institute choir which became a world famous choir they opened radio city music hall they sang for two presidents but to hear um ain't that good news and ezekiel Mm -hmm. saw the wheel with william dawson with a primarily black choir doing those and what I was struck with is, oh my God, those temples are really that fast. Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, but but you know to hear it done like that is really the most amazing piece of it. So I think what we found is that we've we've gone a little more than an hour, and we still we barely scratched the surface. We barely scratched the surface, but uh, I, I my hope for any music educators who are listening to today um, is that you really hear the importance of the need for Negro music, Negro classical music um, in, in the college, in, in music education, so that we can really have a diversity of, of, of thought, of, of history. Um, too many people are leaving undergrad with just the rudimentary knowledge of Mozart, Beethoven, Mahler, um, Dvorak, all of these Western people and are leaving college with knowing just about William Grant Steele and, and, and Joplin. And there is such a host of, of, of music out there 
that is incredible um, by black composers. And if you really want to understand the thought of black people in America during that time, yeah, read, read the autobiography of, of, of Malcolm X and Dr. King and, and things like that, but listen to people like Duke Ellington, listen to people like William, listen to these composers who made a huge mark on not just classical music, but entertainment. I mean, a lot of the composers we talked about today were, were, were doing music for movies and, and for radio shows. And it's just, it's, it made me a little sad to, to realize how much I didn't even know um, about my own people in, in America and about black, black music culture. So I hope you all will take this seriously. And I think, uh, you know, my hope is that conversations like this, the more people learn about it, I think the biggest thing I think you need as a musician or just a lover of music is curiosity to go, I've never heard that. Let me hear it. I want to do that. And the more curious we can get, I, I hope that maybe 20 years, 30 years down the road that our concert experiences look like America, which is mm -hmm. a huge uh, melting pot of all these different cultures and I think the more we find out that what maybe what truly being American is is this synthesis of all of these um, styles that we need we need all of these uh, parts of America represented on our concert stage so I think that's that's kind of I think our goal and and our hope is for all of you is to take a look at those links listen explore think about what your favorite pieces are and just get to learn this and so that's kind of it for this episode so Next time on Morning Coffee and Maestros, we're going to be focusing on miniature masterpieces. These will be choral works of eight minutes or less. Imagine the craftsmanship necessary to compose an entire masterpiece in eight minutes or less. This is going to be hard. It is. While classical composers have often wowed us with large-scale symphonies and masses and requiems, they have also demonstrated their mastery in a matter of only minutes. So think about it. What is your favorite miniature masterpiece? What piece do you go to for your four minutes of bliss? So join us in the conversation of Mastery in Only Minutes, live at 10 a.m. Eastern, Friday, August 21st. And I can promise you John Rutter will not be on my list. He's not on mine either, but I love John <laughs> Rutter. But. We thank you for joining. See, I, I always have to say one thing. There's always to, something controversial. To, to be controversial. <laughs> well, we thank you for joining us today in this conversation uh, it has been great to connect with you all in, in this way every other Friday. And remember, if you're catching us for the very first time, please go back and check out all of our other episodes on our YouTube anytime after they premiere. If you enjoy these conversations, please help us spread the word and let your friends and families know about Morning Coffee. So many of the conversations we've been having have been reaching all over the United States of America. Um, and so please, please continue to, uh, to reach out and, and to see the episodes we're doing. And if you would feel so obliged to, to make a donation to Kikarel with so many of the outreach programs we're doing, we would thoroughly appreciate it. Uh, so thank you for joining us for Morning Coffee. And Maestros. And I have to say, um, now you've irritated everyone who loves John Rutter. <laughs> I mean, you were, we were fine. We'd almost made it through the whole episode, but then you go...